you got your Bible with you, turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to continue in the book of Galatians. <clears throat> We're going to finish chapter 1 today. We have, over the last two weeks, we've already gotten through the first ten verses. And in those verses, if you weren't here, I'm going to give you a quick synopsis. We saw, that, we saw Paul rebuke the Galatians very, very forcefully. He said he was astonished that they were turning away from God. He says, turning away from the one who called you and going after another gospel. Now remember the issue in Galatia. There were, after Paul and Barnabas established the churches and ministered to the churches there in his first and second missionary journey, teachers had come into those churches, false teachers claiming to be Jewish Christians from Jerusalem. Uh, they came into the Galatian churches and they were teaching that Jesus is the Messiah. They were teaching that Jesus it was crucified, that he indeed rose from the grave. But they were telling the Gentiles that you cannot be saved by faith in Jesus alone. You as Gentiles, in order to be right with God, must trust in Jesus and you must be circumcised and walk after the traditions of Moses, keeping the law of Moses. And we're going to see as we walk through Galatians, they were tying this to uh, being children of Abraham and into the Abrahamic covenant. And so they said, just like everybody who's a child of Abraham... You must be circumcised, just like the covenant says so. You must walk in the traditions of Moses and the law. And they were saying that since Paul was not one of the original Jewish Jerusalem, I guess he is Jewish, but Jerusalem apostles, that he had received his message, his gospel, secondhand from the true apostles. And he had changed God's message of salvation, leaving out circumcision, leaving out the law of Moses, so that he would be a man pleaser, so that he would please the Gentiles and they would accept his message. That's what it says in verse 10. Paul is rebuking that, saying, Am I now a man pleaser? If I seek to please men, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. So in response to those accusations, as we walk through verses 1 through 10, Paul said to add anything to the gospel... Even in this case, circumcision is what we're going to see all through Galatians. To add anything to Jesus' death, burial, resurrection by grace through faith in Him, to add anything is to destroy the gospel. And Paul even went so far in verses 8 and 9 to pronounce this harsh curse on anyone teaching a different gospel. In verse 8, we read it last week and talked through it. He says, but even if we, Paul saying, even if I, myself, or the apostles... Even if we or even an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, he says, let him be a curse. Let him be under the curse of God, under the ban of God. Now, as we continue the rest of chapter 1, Paul is going to, he's going to go on to prove the gospel that he preaches is God's gospel. So let's read verses 11 through 24. Those are the verses we're going to deal with today. And then we'll get into it and see Paul's argument from his own words. It says this. He just said, pronounce the curse in 8 and 9. In verse 10, he said, now that I've pronounced this curse, do you think I'm still trying to please men? If I was, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. And then in 11, he says, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, it should say in me, it probably does if you have NIV, NASB, it says in me in the text, ESV translates it to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, he says when God called me, when God revealed his son to me or in me, that I might preach this message to the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, who is Peter, and remained with him 15 days. 
But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Let's pray and ask God to bless our reading of his word. Father, we do thank you. Uh, that you have allowed us to come into this place. Thank you for your presence here amongst us as we are uh, engaging with your word. God, we pray that you would speak to us today. God, we pray that you would speak through your word and that you would uh, show us what you would have us to know. Lord, we want to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So in this section, verses 11 through 24, as we've read it, Paul is defending his apostleship. He's defending the fact that he is an apostle from Jesus Christ And he's also defending the gospel that he preaches. And he does this by showing his conversion and the early years of his ministry. And what we see here is really the proof and the power of God's gospel in the life and the the preaching of Paul. So first, in verses 11 and 12, I want to point you to Paul's thesis. This is kind of 11 and 12 are really the thesis statement that runs through really verse 10 of chapter 2. So this is what he's going to be proving all the rest of chapter 1 and the first 10 verses of chapter 2. He says, I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it by any man, nor was I taught it, but received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And to prove that thesis, he's going to walk through his conversion, his calling to ministry, and the early years of his ministry. So when Paul says, as he had just said in verses 8 and 9, that if anyone preaches another gospel than the one we preach to you, then they're to be accursed... He's not being conceited, he's not being prideful, or he's not seeking followers to to himself. He's saying this because he received the gospel directly from Jesus Christ. We read it in Acts chapter 26 last week. We saw it when we studied Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. Paul was chosen and empowered personally to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the risen Jesus himself. And that is the mark of a true apostle, to be commissioned and sent by the risen Christ. Paul is an apostle sent out from Jerusalem by other people or other apostles. He's an apostle sent by Jesus himself. So Paul's teaching and Paul's preaching is the authoritative message of Jesus given to him by Jesus. The one and only message of God, the gospel. And that's what Paul is seeking to demonstrate through this testimony of his. And he starts proving this thesis that his gospel is not man's gospel in verses 13 and 14 as he goes all the way back to when he was uh, still a, a Jewish persecutor of the church. And he proves to us there that Paul's gospel is not from man. He says, you've heard of my former life in Judaism how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. Paul begins by proving that it wasn't by man or through man that he received the gospel. And he says this by showing us that there was nothing in his religious background or his Jewish background that could account for the transformation that had happened to him. He was a persecutor of the church. He was zealous for the traditions of Judaism, the traditions of his fathers. Having just gone through Acts before we got to Galatians, we're already well aware of how Saul of Tarsus persecuted the church. He went from house to house in Jerusalem, seizing Christians and dragging them off to prison in Acts chapter 8. He was bent on destroying the church. His mission in life was to stamp it out. And at the same time, He was advancing in Judaism, meaning he was gaining prominence. He was uh, gaining status because of his knowledge and his learning and his devotion to the law. He was a rising star in Jerusalem, the student of Gamaliel. Paul was zealous for his religion. And Paul thought, as we, we looked at it in Acts, Paul thought that it was God's will for him to destroy the church. There's no evidence in Acts or in any of Paul's letters that he had a guilty conscience when he was doing this or he he didn't appear to have any self-doubt or any second thoughts or any conviction about what he was doing. He was happy. He was successful. He was moving up in his world and had no reason to change. 
And as he persecuted the church, there can be no doubt that he was well aware of what the church was teaching. That's why he was persecuting them. He knew the facts of what Christians said about Jesus. He knew that they said he was the Messiah. They, he knew that Jesus was crucified, of course, but he also knew that they said he was risen from the dead. And still his heart was set to destroy the church and rid the world of them. He wasn't convinced by their arguments. He wasn't lured away from Judaism by any person. It was God who intervened in Paul's life, not man. He says, this was going on. And in verse 15, he says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Do you see Paul's testimony here shift? It shifts away from what he was doing and what he had done and the greatness of his Judaism and his zeal for God in persecuting the church. It shifts away from what he was doing to what God did. The change in Paul was not gradual. It was not with long periods of thinking and pondering and weighing arguments. It happened in a, momo in a moment without warning. God set, had set him apart. God called him by his grace. God revealed the Son in Paul. God had a plan for Paul. When Paul says that God set him apart before he was born, he's speaking in the same way that God called the prophet Jeremiah and the same way that Isaiah speaks of the suffering servant being called. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated, set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Just as... The prophets of old were chosen and miraculously called. Paul says in verse 15, God chose me to be his prophet to the Gentiles, to be his prophet to the nations. Paul was in a long line of prophets set apart for God and his mission to the nations, to the Gentiles, is the culmination of God's purpose for all of the prophets in the Old Testament, for his mission. So this great and accomplished Jew one who was devoted to the law, one who was keeping the traditions of Moses, one who was actually more committed to living according to the law than any of his peers at the time, he says that he was called to salvation by the grace of God alone. Not any law, not any mixture of law keeping and grace. This one who would who would far surpass any of the Jewish people that were in Galatia now telling them about how they needed to keep some laws in order to be saved. He said, I was doing more than any of you people are. But it was grace that saved me. Paul is saying to the Galatians, the gospel that I'm preaching to you, Galatians, is the same gospel I have experienced. I'm a better Jew than any of these guys are. But it was by grace that I am saved and by grace I'm preaching you to be saved. This Jewish law keeper was transformed and turned from his self-righteousness by the grace of God alone through faith in Jesus Christ. And this only happened because God revealed his son in Paul. Verse 16. Now we know when this happened, it was Acts chapter 9, road to Damascus. But Jesus appeared to Paul in blinding light. But it wasn't just the light of Jesus shining on, Paul, on the outside of Paul's skin that transformed him. It says Jesus was revealed in him. Now the ESV is trying to smooth this out. The interpreters take this to mean it is the event that happened on the road to Damascus. And indeed it is. But the text literally says in me. If you have an NIV, a New American Standard, Holman Christian Standard, King James Version... They all say, in me. That's the proper translation. Paul's conversion took place within him by the power of the Holy Spirit who brings dead sinners to life. And make sure you see this. God didn't just make known to Paul a plan or a philosophy or a doctrine. Paul isn't preaching to the Galatians just a theological philosophy or an alternate belief system or a new worldview. God revealed a person in Paul. God revealed a person to Paul as well. Jesus Christ. Salvation is receiving a person. It's not converting to a new belief system. Well, I guess it is, but it's receiving a person in your soul. The risen Christ by the Holy Spirit entering into you and causing you to be born again. 
It's entrusting yourself to a person, Jesus Christ, who gave his life to pay for your sin, rose from the dead to give you eternal life. Paul says, this grace that I've experienced in the salvation that God has called me to preach to the Gentiles, he says, it's in order that I tell you. This is why it happened. Verse 16, you see it? He says, when he called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me. This is why. In order that, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I know they're saying that I changed the message for the Gentiles, but God called me for this reason, to preach this message, this gospel to you Gentiles. This is why Jesus called me to this. Paul's gospel was not given to him by any human being. It was given directly from Jesus by revelation. Now, Paul's conversion may seem a lot more spectacular than yours might. But your salvation is no less miraculous. God revealed himself in your heart as well. God brought the gospel to you in power and by the Holy Spirit if you have been saved. And he applied that gospel to your heart and he transformed your life if you've been born again. This is the grace of salvation. And though, in all of our cases, God probably did use parents or teachers, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, a friend to give you the gospel, it was God alone that saved you. It was God alone that transformed your heart by the power of the gospel. That's what the gospel does. It is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus transforms hearts by grace alone through faith. And Paul goes on to prove that not only did his gospel not come from man, but it didn't come through man. He shows us here that he didn't receive instruction from any other apostle even after his conversion. The end of verse 16, which we've already read, says, In order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. He says, When God revealed his Son in me and called me to preach to the Gentiles, I didn't go consult with anybody in Jerusalem. I didn't go consult with any apostles. Apostles. Instead of going to Jerusalem, he went away to Arabia. Now, Arabia here is not the deep desert of the Arabian Peninsula that you know today. It was part of the Nabataean Kingdom, which is just east of, of Israel. Here's a map of it. This is from Biblical Archaeological Society. And it shows you the kingdom, the Nabataean Kingdom, which Romans called Arabia. And you can see that it stretched up very close to Damascus. It would have been easy for him to leave Damascus, go preach there, come back to Damascus, and that's exactly exactly what it is. So after his conversion, he preached in Damascus. We saw that in Acts immediately. Then he went away to Arabia and preached there, then came back to Damascus. Now you say, how do you know that he was preaching in Arabia? Well, we know that because when he returned to Damascus, the king of the Nabataean kingdom, Eratus was his name, was seeking to kill him. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians 11. He says that Damascus, the governor under King Aretas, who is the king of the Nabataean kingdom at the time, was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. That's the basket episode that we saw in Acts chapter 9 when we read about that. Why did King Aretas want him dead? Because he'd been preaching the gospel and stirring up the people in Arabia just like he'd done in all the other cities that he went to. So without any contact with any other apostle, he was already preaching to the Gentiles immediately after his conversion. In fact, he says it it wasn't until three years after his conversion that he finally went to Jerusalem. You see it in verse 18? Then, after three years, he'd been preaching to Gentiles for three years. After three years... I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So he says, yeah, three years later I went to Jerusalem. But he says, when I went there, I only saw Peter and James, the Lord's brother, and I only stayed there for 15 days. He wasn't there long enough to become a disciple of Peter. Or absorb the whole counsel of God from Peter and the other apostles. And after this short, brief visit to Jerusalem, he says, I went away to Syria and Cilicia. We saw that in Acts chapter 9, verse 30. 
Cilicia is the province where Paul's hometown was, Tarsus. They were sending him back to Tarsus. And in Tarsus, in Cilicia, that's where Paul stayed for almost a decade until Barnabas found him and brought him to the church at Antioch to help with the church there. We saw that in Acts 11. In fact, if you look at the next verse in chapter 2 of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 1, it was 14 years after his conversion that he finally went to Jerusalem and had any prolonged contact with the apostles. And he had such little contact with Jerusalem during this time that the people of the Judean church didn't know him by sight. It says in verse 22, And I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He you used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Now they knew of him. They knew of the great Saul of Tarsus, the great persecutor of the church. But they didn't know him by sight, technically is what it says. He hadn't been there in years. They only knew the story of this great persecutor of the church who'd been converted, transformed, and was now preaching the faith he once opposed. But Paul says to the Galatians, you're listening to these Jewish Christians telling you all these things. He said, but the Jewish Christians in the Judean churches were glorifying God because of me. They weren't complaining because of what I was preaching or saying that I had changed the message. They were glorifying God because this happened. And the reason was because just like all of the Jews, just like all of the Gentiles, just like every person who has ever been born again, Jesus saved Paul by grace alone and nothing else. The point Paul is making in this extended argument to show that the gospel is not from man but from God, his point is not that his gospel is different from the apostles' gospel. In the next section of Galatians, we're going to see he's going to prove it's the exact same gospel. His point is that he is proving he is an independent witness of the same gospel that has been preached in Jerusalem. And he's commissioned by Jesus Christ. His point is that neither his mission nor his message came from man, nor was it guided or influenced by man. He informs the Galatians and us that this is God's message. This is God's gospel. And regardless of what anyone says, it is the truth of God. And that is why Paul is fighting so hard in chapter 1 and all through Galatians, actually. He's fighting so hard to make sure nothing is added to the gospel among the Galatians. Make sure they're not listening to these people who are adding things to the gospel. Make sure the people that are teaching these things know that they are accursed, he said in verse 8 and 9. It's because the gospel is the power of God. Only the true gospel can save. Only the true gospel can change hearts and save a soul from sin. That is God's message. Not my message, not granny's message, not your Sunday school teacher's message, not Paul's message. That is God's message to humanity. That is His gospel. Listen, today I don't know what you're living for. I don't know what you're putting your hope in. But regardless of how religious you are or how moral you are living, according to Scripture, it doesn't matter what you're doing, what works you have, what ceremonies you're doing, what religious things that you're doing, according to Scripture, unless Christ is revealed in you, unless you've been born again by the Spirit of God, trusted in Jesus, the Bible says you are an enemy of God separated from Him by your sin. And there is no behavior modification, no religious works, no reforming of your life, no turning over a new leaf, no making a new commitment, no anything that can change that. There is nothing you can do. Without Christ, you are a criminal before God's law trying to bribe the judge with good works. And right behavior. But one day, true, perfect justice will have its way. Now, I know that sounds harsh and it sounds cruel, but I want you to understand something. If God is holy, like the Bible says He is, and sin is as wicked as the Bible says it is, God would be right 
to condemn you and stop your heart and at this moment and cast you from His presence forever. It would be righteous. It would be good. It would be holy. It would be just. And all of creation and all of the angels in heaven would praise God's glorious goodness and righteousness if He did so. I got saved when I was 29 years old. When I was 11 now, I walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, but I didn't trust in Jesus until I was 29 years old. And it is just the mercy of a benevolent God that allowed me to live in rebellion to Him, breathing His air, living on His planet without destroying me for my sin. And if He would have done so, if He would have destroyed me in my sin before, I, before Christ saved me, if He would have destroyed me and cast me into hell for all eternity, the angels in heaven would have glorified His goodness for doing so. It would be right. But that's not what God did. God so loved the world that He gave His Son to take your place. His Son, to receive the punishment that you and I deserve, to pay for your sin by His death on a cross and by His life and His resurrection to raise you to eternal life. Today, if you don't know Christ, that gift, that life is being held out to you today to trust in Jesus, to receive His grace. That is God's only message. That is God's only gospel for salvation. That is God's only way. His Son, Jesus Christ. If you don't know Him today, I would urge you, please, before another beat of your heart passes, trust in Him. You don't have time to wait. And believer, if you're in here and you're born again, you've trusted Jesus, like the Galatians that Paul calls brothers, I would have you know brothers, and he tells them not to listen to these things, we must stand in the gospel of God. We must be a people who fight for the truth of God's gospel. For that truth to be proclaimed to the nations, but also for that truth to be lived out in our own lives. If anyone preaches a different gospel, let them be accursed. That's what he said. Even if it's our own heart that preaches it to us. Last week, I made a statement that we must be a people that walk in the gospel. I probably made it two weeks ago. This is one of my sure enough pet peeves, and I believe it is the message to Christians in the New Testament, to walk in the gospel. I said that at the end of the sermon last week, but I realized, and it dawned on me, that I didn't really tell you how to walk in the gospel last week. So I want to take just a minute to tell you why Paul is making such a big deal about saying this is God's gospel. Why he's making such a, a big case for the fact that he wasn't influenced by other apostles or other men or anything. It was Jesus Christ and it's his gospel. He wants the Galatians to walk in the gospel and not listen to these people that are saying you need to add this and you need to add that. And we must do the same even if it's our own hearts that add to it. To walk in the gospel means that you understand day by day that you are a far, far worse sinner than you think you are. You don't even realize the depth of your sin and neither do I. You don't know what sins that you're going to commit in the future. Fifteen years from now, you're going to wake up and you're going to sin. And you have no idea what's going to happen 15 years from now. You don't know the depth of your sin in your heart, in your mind. You don't know the sins of omission that you may be committing all the time and don't realize it. You don't know how bad of a sinner you are. But you are far worse than you think you are. But God knows, God knows the complete depths of your sin and mine. He knows more fully than you do how much of a sinner that I am and that you are. He knows your heart. He knows your thought. He knows, thought you, he knows your motivations. He knows the sin that you're going to commit 15 years from now. And He saved you anyway. 
He cleansed you from all of your sin, even the sin that you don't even know you have. The sin that you don't even know that you're going to commit 15 years from now. So walking in the gospel means you understand, I don't even realize how bad of a sinner I am. And when condemnation comes to you, believer, when you fail, when you sin, and it it presses down upon you and leads you to start to despair, when that falls upon you in your sin and it leads you to those things, you can say, listen, I already know that I don't even understand how bad a sinner I am. I'm way worse of a sinner than even you say I am, devil. But he saved me anyway. He knows the depth of my sin even better than I do. And it goes for the other side too, believer. When you're doing great, when you're serving Christ better than you ever have before in your life, when you're worshiping God more deeply, more fully than you ever have in your whole life, you still say, I have no righteousness of my own at all. Jesus paid it all and he gave me his righteousness. So on my best day, I add absolutely nothing. Because there's going to come a day when it's not your best day. And if you're counting on your works, your righteousness, your worship, your anything to make you right with God or to be pleasing before God or to, or to increase your standing before God, oh, that's, that's a recipe for disaster because when it's not there, you're going to be dropped into the pit of despair. In the gospel, you have everything. In this life... We are growing in holiness. If you're, a, if, you're, if you're lost today and you hear me saying, yay, we got the gospel, I can sin all I want to, that means that you're lost and you're going to bust hell wide open when you die. You need to be saved. But as a believer with a new heart, you want to serve Christ. You desire to please Him. You desire to live for Him. The way you do it is walking in the gospel. Amen. You are pleased. You are pleasing in his sight because of Jesus Christ and you're able in freedom to go and walk after Christ knowing that you're not going to do it perfectly you're not going to do it righteously but you're free from walking on eggshells thinking that daddy's going to throw me out of his house if I don't do right Jesus paid it all so walking in the gospel means we don't add to the gospel we don't add to the gospel when we fail and we say oh God's not pleased with me anymore. I got to do something else. I got to do this work. I got to do that work. I got to do these things. No, we have the gospel. We don't add to it. And we don't add to the gospel when we're doing our righteous works and our religious works and we're just living as as pleasing as we possibly can to the Lord. And man, we sure are proud of ourselves. We don't add to the gospel and say, well, God sure loves me more today than he did yesterday. No, sir. Perfect in Christ or absolutely separated from God. Those are your only two options. Now, in your practice, in your walk, in your life, you're going to be growing in holiness. You're going to be, you're going to be growing closer to God. Your relationship is going to deepen. Your knowledge of Him, your knowledge of the Word is going to deepen. That is going to be growing until you leave this earth. But in your position before the judgment bar of God, you are either perfect in Christ or you are absolutely separated from God with no goodness whatsoever. There's no middle ground. We don't have to add to the gospel. We don't have to add to the gospel when we're living righteously and doing wonderful. We can't give ourselves a higher status than Jesus has given us before God. To walk in the gospel, therefore, means we must continually remind ourselves He paid it all. He paid the whole price. He has given me a perfect righteousness. And when I stand before God, I have no righteousness of my own. I'm going to stand in His and I am holy and blameless in His sight because of the gospel. There's nothing else that can be added to it. When you sin, the gospel is all you have. When you do good, the gospel is still all you have. And it is all that you need. Paul's point in this text is to prove that God has given us His gospel. There is no other way to be saved. There is no other way to walk in Christ. I want to put one more verse up here before we go. This has nothing to do with Galatians 1, but it really spoke to me this week. Whether you're lost this morning or whether you are saved this morning and you're dealing with despair and doubt or 
religious righteousness. Ephesians 5, 14 says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Call out to Jesus today, and He will save you. He will shine on you. As Paul said, the light of Christ revealed His Son in me. God revealed His Son in me. He will shine on you. Believer, stop adding to the gospel. He's given you everything. Stop walking in your works. Stop walking in what you can do for God or what you haven't done for God and start walking in the gospel. Get, wake up and Christ will shine on you. How is God calling you to respond today? Trust in Jesus and receive His salvation. Let's pray. Father, we do love You. We thank You for Your Word. God, we thank You for the gospel. Thank You for Paul's testimony, God, his proof that the gospel is not from his imagination or from some other person's influence, God. His proof that you gave him the gospel inspired his word that he wrote in Galatians, this inerrant, infallible word. We have your message, your gospel. And when our own hearts preach to us another gospel, Lord, let us label it accursed and walk in the gospel that you've given us. God, I pray that the believers in this room, God, that you would show us what it means to fight, to fight to trust the gospel alone, to fight to understand that we don't even understand the depths of our sin, but you do. When we fail, God, I pray that you would show us that you already knew. You already knew what was in our heart. You already knew what was in our mind. You already knew what was in our flesh and you saved us anyway. And you paid for it. God, when we do great things for you, when we strive after you as you've called us to do and we're obedient to you as you've called us to do, God, I pray you would still give us the beauty of the gospel knowing that we have added absolutely nothing to our standing before you. That you have given us everything. And God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, Maybe they've been trying just to do religious works and do good things to try to be better, try to act better, try to live better, try to please you. God, I pray you'd show them the utter futility of it as if they're trying to bribe the judge. God, and that you would show them the cross, show them the resurrection, show them the price that you have paid so that we might be saved and that they would call out upon you that they would repent of their sin and that they would trust alone in Jesus Christ and Him raised from the dead as their payment. God, I pray that you would move in hearts today. We do love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, I'm going to stand right down here. I'd love to pray with you. You come. Will you stand with me?